All right, AU, thank you for doing this, man. Um, thank you for for signing on here. You know, I this is an article that I've been thinking about for a long time, actually. Um, there, I, I have a lot of little gripes with the way that the NBA presents and promotes its product. And, um, you know, it's, it's funny. Like, I, I think a lot of people are really hesitant to criticize them for some reason. But, you know, there's just a lot of stuff that they do wrong. And uh, I tried to lay that out here in this piece. And, and we'll talk about them in this video. Um, but yeah, man, uh, you know, first off for everybody listening, my name is Mike O'Connor. This is Andrew Unterberger. Um, as always, this video is sponsored by Body Bio. Um, so first off, AU, how are you doing, man? Uh, I'm doing all right. I'm, I'm still not exactly, uh, uh, you know, ready to jump back into the basketball world fully fledged. I, I watched, you know, maybe two and a half of the finals games and you know, tuned in for the fourth quarter of a couple of them. Uh, I have paid zero attention to what's going on with Team USA. I hear they lost a couple times. That's probably not a good thing. Uh, but uh, aside from that, uh, no, I, I, I'm 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 ready to uh, to hopefully you know help you come up with an improved product for next year. And so, do you have like a a, a specific objective with your improving of the NBA? Like, is, is there like one kind of overarching like concept or, or overarching issue that you're trying to fix here, or is it just a lot of little things? No, it's a lot of things that blend together in a certain way. I mean, I, I actually to give a little background on how this came to be. You know, I started I started getting into this this idea last year during the original quarantine um, because I was watching some Euro League and I was just really impressed with like how much smoother and cleaner of, of a presentation it was from a TV perspective. So so that actually kind of leads me into the first point, which I, I want to run by you, which, you know, AU has not read the article, which I'm excited about because I get his live reaction. Um, but I want to I want to know what your thoughts are on this. because This is probably the most radical thing that I propose. OK. There should be a single announcer format on all broadcasts. No more color commentators. No hmm. more. And the reason I say that is because I truly believe that color commentators in basketball have an inherently impossible job and the role just should not exist, right? You think about other sports. Baseball, there's lulls in between every pitch. You need that free-flowing conversation because otherwise it gets too boring. Basketball, like... It, there's no clear time where the play-by-play -play guy should stop and the color guy should start, right? And I, f I feel like, like I made the point in the article that if you look at like the most prominent crew in the league, right, it's Mike Breen, Jeff Van Gundy, Mark Jackson. It feels like Van Gundy and Jackson are doing a podcast and Breen is like trying to interject to like describe the game. And it, it just shouldn't be that way. And the, the, the thing that I point out is that in the Euro League, they already have like, not all games, but some games are single announcer format. And the one announcer is able to do everything just fine, right? Like he's able to provide the play-by-play -play and he's able to provide color on the side without interruptions or, or stuff like that. For anybody listening from Philly, if you know, if you ever listen to Tom McGinnis on the radio, like you'll know the feeling I'm talking about. Like he just gets you so immersed in the game. He has your complete focus. There's no distraction. Um, and I just make the point in general that color, color commentators – invariably do the opposite of what they're supposed to do. What they're supposed to do is take you deeper into the game and they invariably take your attention away from the game. It's the, the, there'll be some play going on and they'll be talking about some obscure rule or a player's backstory or whatever. And it's like, why are you taking my attention out of the game? Like, let, let me just focus on this. Right. So there's a lot that goes into that, but I'm curious what you think, what you think about that. Uh, the, the local TV channels are going to love this idea. I mean, they're already getting rid of sideline reporters, just get rid of the, the color guys too, I guess. Uh, I, I I think there's something to this idea. I like it more for national than I do for local. I mean, okay. when, when, especially when you when you go down like the national teams. Uh, you know, you mentioned uh, Breen Van Gundy and Jackson, and really all the TNT. Uh, their kind of go-to duos. Really, like the only one I think that has any sort of high approval rating with NBA Twitter at the moment is probably Doris Burke, and from from the color side. Uh, and I, I think that especially it's, it's, a, it's a tough ask with some of these ex-athletes and some of the, the people that don't really do this uh, for a living or they do this, but they do 18, other, you know, 18 million other things as well to sort of have the, the knowledge of the minutia of every team in the league, which is what their job is to cover, you know, these national broadcasts, you know, and they're talking about the Sixers, uh, you know, they, they need to know who Shake Milton is. They need to know what the deal with Zaire Smith was like. They need to know all these kind of small things to sort of really get, give you the, the depth that you need on the broadcast. And it's a tough ask to, to, to have them do that for all the teams that they might be covering. Uh, so if you want to get rid of it on a national level where nobody really likes these guys to begin with, and, you know, maybe you just kind of leave it in the hands of the, the, the true professionals. Sure. I, I can, I can see that. 
I think it w- I think you would be missing something on the local broadcast because there's something to these teams that have been together for 20 years. Like uh, you talk about Mike Green, you talk about Mike Green and Clyde Frazier. Like that's you know, it wouldn't be a Knicks game without those two guys. I don't think. Uh, and you know, uh, you, you know, when 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 Zoom off was was with uh, was with Malik, and then to a lesser extent even with Allah, like they, they develop a chemistry, they develop a rapport with each other, with the team, with the franchise as a whole. I think that 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 is a feeling I would miss if it was gone entirely. Uh, so I would keep it for the local teams, but I, I agree with you that maybe it would be an improvement for the national broadcast. I will say that, you know, if you were to get rid of color commentators entirely, I don't think people are understanding or appreciating how much different of a viewing experience it is. Your focus is just completely on the game um, in a way that you you can't get with with color commentators because they're inherently like, you know, just talking about a play from 45 seconds ago, or they're talking about some player's backstory, whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, but that kind of brings me actually to the second point, which is that I, I just think the NBA does a horrendous job of actually keeping our focus on the game. And, you know, like, like the name of the game, like in today, in any entertainment product is don't let people get distracted. Don't lose their attention because we have such short attention spans. Right. So the second point that I make is that we need to overhaul the approach to in-game stoppages. And again, to steal from the EuroLeague, like there's a few things that they do that are so much better, right? So much better than the NBA. So the first thing is that they're way more efficient in the use of replay on the broadcast. They um, they don't do any in-game ad reads, which I don't think people realize how intrusive that is. Um, and they just have a, they like prioritize speeding up the stoppages. So I include a, a clip in the, a couple clips in the article one is from the 2019 NBA Finals, and it's a clip where Kyle Lowry gets fouled, and he's after he gets fouled, it's like a, it's a play that I would have liked to see a replay of. Like it's like not clear that he was fouled. The broadcast goes to a replay of a layup from 45 seconds ago, <laughs> where Van Gundy is like breaking down the play. I still haven't seen the replay of the foul. Um, then they cut back, and like everyone's just like wandering around at the foul line, like n- like no subs have been made, nothing's going on. They're just wandering around. No, like the refs still have the ball. Then Breen goes into a uh, an ad read for YouTube TV, which is like like just think about it. it's it's all very subtle, but think about how many places you've taken my attention in such a short span. Like there was a foul, I didn't see a replay. You've like I've probably already taken out my phone. I'm not paying attention anymore because you're showing me Serge Ibaka's layup from a minute ago that I don't care about. Then you're going to read me an ad from YouTube TV and we still haven't shot that. We're not through the free throws. Like then I compare that to the EuroLeague where what they do is as soon as they are so good with replay, as soon as there's a foul, it's literally two seconds. And there's a replay of that play from multiple angles. So efficient. And on this play that I show in the clip, there's a foul. They show the replay and you wouldn't even see during the replay, but there's substitutions made because they do their subs before the first free throw as opposed to in between them, which really speeds it up. They fly through the two free throws. The EuroLeague clip altogether is 12 seconds shorter. Like that is valuable time. And the EuroLeague kept my attention the entire time because immediately after the foul, they showed me a replay. And then we were back to actual game action of shooting a free throw with no delays, no nothing. So I'm curious if you agree that just the, the, the amount, the, the lack of priority of like speeding up the stoppages and keeping people's attention. Don't you think that's really hurting the NBA product? Well, when you talk about replay, I thought you were going to go into the uh, like actual review. And we'll talk about that. Okay, all right. So maybe I'm, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself there. Uh, in terms of like the, the free throw stoppages and the showing of replay of key plays and stuff like that, that that isn't like a grievance that I, I super have. I mean, I, uh, my viewing experience a lot of the time is not the same as most people because I'll, I'll often tape games and fast forward through free throws and or I'll watch on mute and so I don't even hear what's going on really. Uh, so I, I, I'm not maybe the best judge of that sort of thing. But yeah, I, I mean, like I, I do find the YouTube, uh, the, those style ad reads distracting. I really don't like uh, the gambling uh, ads that they, that they have during free throws and, and they, they cut the TNT studio and Charles Barkley says like, oh yeah, I'm taking over 25 points for Bradley Beal tonight. Like, like that sort of thing. I find that yeah, kind of unsafe. Can I tell you the worst one? Can I tell you the sure. worst yeah, one? Yeah, please, hit me. The worst is when they go to split screen for an ad for a game like later on that night. Mm-hmm. Like we'll be watching the East Coast game and then they're advertising the primetime game and it's like, why am I watching an ad for the NBA while I'm watching the NBA? It's like, I also I also really don't like when they do either coach interviews or sideline interviews with you know some notable person that's at the game and they'll keep that in the big screen and have the game in the small screen or even doing a split. 
like will you show me what the person looks like then get back to the game i don't i don't need to see the person to know who's continuing to talk in this conversation uh, so yeah, I mean, little things like that they do add up, and uh, if if the Euro League is really like has has kind of nailed the formula here, I certainly wouldn't uh, like protest a, a change to that sort of formula. It's not if, if I was making a list of the fifteen things that bother me the most about the NBA watching experience, that that, that wouldn't necessarily be on there. But uh, yeah. maybe the watching experience, but not about like like fixing the NBA on the whole. But I that, that also could be it also could be one of those things that you don't even notice how much it bothers you until you you see it done right, and then I can That's see that it. entirely. That's exactly what I was going to say, because I, I think that no one else like I wouldn't have come up with this stuff have, had I not been watching EuroLeague and been like, wow, this is so much better without it. Like, I'm sure there are people listening like, what are you talking about? Like, that's not <laughs> like it, I'm not like infuriated when I hear an ad for YouTube TV, like, you know, but like you don't understand how much it's distracting you and you don't understand how much smoother and more immersive it feels when there's none of that. Um, and just one last thing on the replay stuff. Um, as it pertains to color commentators, there's a clip I include of a, a foul call. It was, it was a bad call. And former Sixer Scotty Wilbekin is arguing the call. And the single announcer who's calling the game, instead of like, instead of, I just thought about how if this were an NBA game, Mark Jackson would be like screaming in my ear right now about how like this is a terrible call. We need to change the rules. The announcer just says, uh, they feel they're not getting the decisions right now as Wilbekin leads the protest. And I was like, whoa like you just let me decide for myself what i can think because i'm an adult with eyeballs and a brain mm. like it's so much better man it's ah oh, it's, it's so much better. Pace, certainly. yeah yeah all right uh number three which we sort of touched on very briefly i think we could cut out 90 percent of replay replay reviews including the coach's challenge and lose absolutely nothing mm. what do you think i mean it would make the game watching experience a lot better i i it's tough because I do like the coach's challenge in theory. I think it's important to get calls right. And it's so frustrating to, to lose a game on it. I mean, especially now that we have so many angles of replay and there's, there's Twitter video and, and it, it's very You can't really skate by on a questionable call anymore, at least in like the eyes of the larger NBA watching universe. So it, you don't really want a pivotal game or pivotal moment decided by a call. That's very clearly not as it should be. And you want to have the, the power to change that if possible. I like the challenge system. I think that you probably shouldn't lose a timeout for a, for a, you know you you you, sh you shouldn't be penalized in any way for a correct uh, for, for a challenge that is uh that that is overturned uh and I I wish that there was just a way to do it quicker I I, I mean there probably is and I, I don't know what the Euroleague does for this or if they just don't have it at all uh but I I think I think the the con the concept of the challenge is important and I don't see that going away anytime soon I would just try to tighten it up as much as possible. That's fair. As, as long as we can agree that it's gone like too far mm -hmm. and we need to, we need to do something to, you know, like I said, it, it, it all kind of ties together. And it's like, if you are stopping a game at every point in the last two minutes, like it doesn't even do feel like a, 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 an entertainment product. It feels like we're in, we're in a court hearing, like it, it's ridiculous. So um, yeah, I mean, I think everyone would agree with that. I don't think there's like too much pushback there, but uh, number four, start the damn games on time. <laughs> I like nice use of caps there, CJ. Well done. <laughs> um, I I don't have too much to say about this, but what I will say is that on behalf of uh, like just for the NBA and the broadcast partners, if there is anyone from those parties listening right now, you are pathetic. It is pathetic. <laughs> it is fucking pathetic that what you do. You are worse than like clickbait YouTubers, like saying that you'll start a game at eight o'clock and it starts at eight twenty one. It's so fucking unbelievably blatant what you're doing. You're it's like it's it's worse than movie previews when you know that you're going to a movie. Like you you are you are taking more time and liberty than they would. And it's like no other sport does this. When the NFL says a game starts at one o'clock, starts at one o'clock. When the MLB says a game starts at seven oh five, it starts at seven oh five. Like it's pathetic. It's fucking pathetic. Why do you think it's getting worse? Is it just the the idea you want to get? Well, but but is 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 the commercials or is it the exposure for the pregame shows or like uh... all of it? All of it. I mean, and I, I, I think that maybe they they feel like and probably rightfully so when they say a game starts at eight. You know, there's probably plenty of people who are like who who maybe aren't free until mm -hmm. eight fifteen, and then they get those viewers too, and. Look, I mean, like, I, I can't deny that, like, they're probably making more money because of this. But, like, just as a diehard fan, it's it's so annoying and it's so blatantly pathetic because yeah, it's 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 it's, it's, it's uh, the equivalent of clickbait. 
Yeah. Like that's what it is. And it's like, you are a billion dollar corporation doing this. Like you're fucking pathetic. Um, all right. Sorry. I got so mad there. <laughs> no, I love it. No. I, I, <laughs> and, and, and like this is, I mean, I, I don't even really remember this being a talking point before this, this, this postseason. Yeah. I don't know if it's just that much worse or if it's a cumulative thing or, or if just, just, you know, people need something to complain about, but it, it, this definitely feels like uh, we've reached kind of a critical mass with the complaining about the games, not starting on time. And, and, Hopefully that means they'll actually do something about it in the, in the season to come. Hopefully. Um, number five, it's a very simple one. They need to either go back to wearing home white uniforms or just get better at planning the Jersey contrast. I, either one. I don't care. I think the jerseys right now in the NBA are worse than they have probably ever been. I think they've gotten worse in the last 15 years without question. Um, and I include a screenshot in that article. I'm sure CJ will put it up. Uh, it's, the Sixers against the Lakers on January 27th. It was the game where Tobias hits the game winner. And it's the Sixers are home. The Lakers are wearing blue throwbacks that perfectly match the Sixers, like the paint on the Sixers floor. And the Sixers are wearing red. And the colors don't look good together. And the Lakers look like the home team. And it's like, if you're a novice fan or even like a super casual fan, you would tune in and think the Lakers were home. And like, it's not like you're like, oh, sick, dude. The Lakers are wearing blue. Like, dude, that's so awesome. I'm so glad I got to see this. Like, wow, the NBA is so good at this stuff. Like, wh why are we doing this? It looks hideous. We're, we're confusing the novice fan. Like, I just don't get it. Why do we suck at uniforms? And this, this is the one part of the, like, the jersey complaining that I can sort of relate to. Like, people complain about like uh, the, 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 the different styles of jerseys, that there's too many jerseys. I quote the great Mike Levin where he says that all jerseys are great because basketball players play in them and basketball is great. Uh, I, I, there, there are no jerseys that I don't, that I don't like uh, jerseys that I don't like now. And this is my thing about jerseys in general is that people complain about whatever the, the, the boathouse road jerseys in 10 years, those are going to be a collectible and people are going to be like, Oh, you should go back to the boathouse road jerseys. Like any Jersey that isn't cool now, it just means that it's going to be cool in 10 to 15 years. So I don't really, that, 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 that sort of angle doesn't really have much truck with me. But I do agree with you that it's weird to watch a basketball game and not immediately know which team is which, uh, yeah. and that is kind of where we're going with, with the, the, there's too many, there's there is there are too many jersey variants and there, there's not there, there are they don't do a good enough job of planning them where yeah it, two teams end up wearing light colors or one team ends up wearing the colors that the other team is more associated with that seems stupid that there should be just kind of general like you know lights versus versus non lights or you know uh, the, 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 there there should be an easy sort of way to kind of separate okay you wear these types of your a million variants of your jerseys on the road and you wear these types at home and then you know never the twain shall meet i think that's probably the, the right way to do it but i, I don't mind you know if the, the sixers want to wear a different jersey every you know all 41 home games of the season that's fine by me uh yeah. i think that'd be cool I, i'm not gonna buy all of them uh i don't think anybody's gonna buy all of them but uh but i i i, I say yes to more jerseys but keep them organized uh number six eliminate the cheap fouls and the take fouls like the backcourt fouls to stop a mm. fast break. I mean, that's just like so easy. Like just, just stop it. Like it, it I, I suggest the rule that outside of the last two minutes, intentional fouls in the backcourt are two shots on the ball. Mm. Um, so like that you can stop it. Yeah. yeah. You can stop it tomorrow. Um, but I also think like there's a lot of stuff that everyone talks about pretty often as far as like non-basketball motions, like, um, the rip through moves or like, like the jumping into a, like lunging sideways into a defender while you're shooting a three to draw a foul. Um, and I want to point out, like I, I, I made this point in the article that I just think like those types of plays highlight how this entire list comes together, right? Like a dude pump fakes, gets a dude in the air, jumps sideways into him, draws three, draws three foul shots. And while they're, instead of showing the replay of that, they show the replay of a layup from 45 seconds ago while Van Gundy is screaming at you that they need to change the rules. And then you cut back into the free throw and Breen like awkwardly interjects with an ad read. And it's like, what a fucking garbage part of the viewing experience that is. Like, it's like, why can't, like, we need to, again, like so many overarching points of mine here are just like cut back on the stoppages and make them better. And if we can eliminate some of these really stupid foul calls, where we then have to go and like listen to Van Gundy rip the league a new one. It's like, why can we not just, just do that? Yeah. I'd be curious. Like it's not going to be me, but I'd be curious to hear somebody argue like the pro side of this. Like, like are, are there people that that say like, no, you're, 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 you're maybe you're, you're gatekeeping too much on the, on the, the refereeing experience or no, you're, 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 you're hindering the offensive uh, value of these players by, by cutting down on fouls like this. Like there must be some sort of counter argument to this, but I, 
couldn't tell you what it is. I'm certainly not going to argue it myself. Yeah, like uh, get rid of the stuff immediately. Uh, yeah. So I, I apologize if I'm uh, you know uh, stepping on one of your later points here. How do you feel about charges in general? Because I, I know there's people that say just eliminate charges too. Is, is, does that come up for you? It doesn't come up for me. Um, I wouldn't be against it. I do think that like. Look, I'm not saying that they aren't dangerous, but it is often portrayed as like this like heinous play and like how many people got injured from taking charges this year. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, and there is like a, a, you know, kind of an art to it. Like Kyle Lowry's amazing at it. And it's like they really are exciting late in the game when you when you can like time it right and stuff like that. So I wouldn't be opposed to them taking it out. Um, but I do think that it's probably the, the criticisms of it probably go a little far. Yeah, it's too far for me too. I, I I do like charge. I think they're an important kind of strategic element in the game. I would I wouldn't eliminate them. All right. Well, that brings us to number seven, um, which is just kind of generally increase the amount of physicality allowed from perimeter defenders. Like, I just think that the NBA has gone a little too far in allowing um, in allowing you know just offensive players to do whatever they want, and any bit of contact is deemed a foul. Um, I'm always amazed at the difference in what they will allow in the post versus on the perimeter. Mm -hmm. Like Embiid can literally wrestle and like shove a dude, like they can be fighting for position. But if they did that, like five feet closer to the perimeter, it's like a foul on both of them. Um, it just kind of like doesn't make sense to me. And um, yeah, I just think that what it would do if we can bring down the scoring and increase what defense can do, like it adds so much tension to the game. Like I, if you watch the Knicks this year, You'll know what I'm talking about. Like every game was grinded out. Like a six point lead feels like a big deal. If like a role player makes a, a, a pull up jumper and late in the game, it feels like huge. Like it, it's so much tension. Right. And like that's what keeps your eyes on the game. And when it's just two teams going back and forth, like getting easy, easy, easy shots, there's not there's no tension. Like it, it, it kind of ties into the NBA, like just treating the sport like it's like this like to be easily digestible on highlights, but not as a television product. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I don't know. What do you think about, you know, kind of yeah, turning no, the clock I, back? I, I, I agree with that. I mean, I, I think – I noticed that. I mean, it's easy to say as a Sixers fan because we don't have any of these guys, but I definitely noticed, uh, you know, the, the, the postseason before this one when, you know, it's not just uh, the Damian Lillard, James Harden, Steph Curry tier of, of perimeter players that seem absolutely unstoppable on the perimeter. It's guys like Donovan Mitchell and, and Jamal Murray who are, are very good players, Devin Booker, who, who are really, really good players, but shouldn't be on that level where it's just like we can't do anything with these guys on a regular basis. And they have entire series where they're just kind of lighting it up sort of un unhindered. Uh, so, I mean, it, it, it's hard to, I, I think it's, it's always hard to sell with the league, uh, you know, rule changes that eliminate offense or dampen offense because everyone thinks scoring is what people want to see. And for the most part, they're right. But there does get to be a certain point where you have these kind of second tier guys going off for 45 and it, it does make it a little bit less exciting when, when guys like Steph and Dan do it, like it, it, it does kind of feel like it's, it's maybe not as impressive an accomplishment as it used to be. And, and it does feel like, we, we are kind of underselling the potential of exciting. There are, I think there are people out there that find defense exciting when it, when it's kind of played at the most electric level. And, you know, I, again, easy to say the Sixers fans, we have two of the, two of these guys in Ben Simmons and Matias Dival, but those guys are fun to watch too. You want them to be able to kind of achieve their, you know, their own potential and their own, their own greatness. And when you kind of have their, their hands tied behind the back, I mean, how many times did we see Matisse Dival defending Trey Young and Trey Young kind of puts a shoulder into him and gets called for the, Matisse gets called for the foul. And that that's, that's limiting those players. I mean, Matisse could be a star in his own right, but not if he's if, if the calls are always going to go Trey's way in, in those kind of matchups. So, I mean, yeah, the, again, prejudice but for any number of reasons here, but I agree that this is a, a sort of thing that would make the league a, a better watching experience. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you agree. Um, I also think, you know, it would allow for potentially other avenues for teams to build contenders, right? Like there's no way the, the mid 2010s Grizzlies could be a contender today, right? Like, um, but if you could, successfully build a team of like all elite defenders mm -hmm. i'm laughing at myself saying this but like <laughs> the, the 2019 26ers <laughs> that sure. like idea um would make more sense not that any team could ever play offense with that roster but um but yeah like that you would allow for you know more team building avenues as well number eight uh drastically increase the number of delay of game calls mm -hmm. from lobbying with officials and i just i make the point you know that like they this is not something that's going to be settled with like a meeting with the players to say, Hey guys, please stop sequestering the officials for 20 seconds and demanding that they replay everything in, in crunch time. Like 
It's not going to be solved that way. What you have to do is you just have to start calling delay of game calls. Um, if you if you are lobbying with an official for too long, um, I just think it's 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 gone too far. Like I mean, it's not like like I said, all all of this stuff kind of ties together in the sense that none of it is like heinous. None of it is like you're watching it and you're like, man, this sucks. But when you add it all up, it's really a brutal you know it's a brutal product. So I don't know. Do you think that the the lobbying with officials has gone too far? Uh, I mean, it's definitely gone too far because everybody does it. Uh, I, I don't know if that necessarily slows down the game that much. I, I'm in favor of more delay of game penalties in general, but I feel like it's it's, it's a real tough sell with, with the with the league. I mean, do you remember there was a, there was a season maybe at the beginning of the last decade or you know some sometime eight to ten years ago where they wanted to make a point of emphasis that if the team that scored touched the ball uh, mm-hmm. before it goes out of bounds and then the other team's inbounding that that was like an instant delay of game penalty. And they enforced it through the preseason and maybe through like the first week of the season, and then they just completely let it go. Uh, I feel like that happens once every couple of years with, with a rule like that and the delay of games. They, they try to make a an emphasis of it. And they kind of hope that it's going to carry throughout the season if they call it for the first week or two. And sometimes it does, but usually it doesn't. Uh, I, I, I feel like this is going to be like that too, or we'll see it a lot early, and they'll talk about it on the national broadcast. Like, oh, this is a new point of emphasis this season. And then once we get into January, we'll never hear about it again. Yeah, and they, they do that with like flopping too, right? Where yeah, they sure. they try to make a rule against flopping, and they they try to implement these fines, and it's like they'll lend, lend out like ten fines a year in total, and guys and they're are all flopping. in the first month and a half of the season too. Yeah, right, and and guys are flopping every single night, and it's like, yeah. I mean, why like why even make the rule at that point? So <laughs> yeah, I guess I guess this could be a two part thing, which is make the rule and then enforce it. They actually, um, enforce it, yeah. all right, this is a, a much different one than I have suggested, you know, so far. Um, this is. I, I don't know if I've gotten mm-hmm. the numbers exactly right, but I do think this is a good idea. Loyalty incentives in the salary cap. So what I propose here is that if you've been on the same team for five or more years, only 50% of your salary counts against your team's cap. And if you've been on your team for 10 or more years, only 20% of your salary counts against the team's cap. So the example I use, and the reason I, the reason I put this in is because, you know, just to kind of like, make make it easier you know or more appealing for players mm-hmm. to stay with teams for longer periods of time um and the example i use is like damian lillard who's on the super max like he's taking up 40 percent of his team's cap for the next five years and it's like how are they supposed to build around that so the point i make is that you know as an example dame is going into his 10th year next year so next year he would get paid his full 39.3 million dollar salary but only 20% of that, which is 7.8 million, would count against the cap. So for Portland's sake, going into next year, instead of being 17.5 million over the cap, they'd be th- about 14 million under it. Mm-hmm. So they could sign, you know, another a couple more like good players, right? And plus their non-taxpayer mid-level exception. Um, what is your gut feel towards this? Well, I have two kind of reactions to that. I mean, I think it would make it would make for more uh, super teams, but I guess it would make for more organic super teams. And that do you get priority for teams that were that draft that that, you're, that drafted the players, or is it just even if you're signed a free agency, as long as you're there for five years, it counts the same way. Correct, it counts the same. Okay. Way. I mean, I, obviously, the super team era has, has gone pretty. I don't know if I say too far, but it's gone pretty far, and it's rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. I feel like people would have less of a problem with it if it were for homegrown teams like uh, you know the Thunder of a decade ago. Uh, and then you you wouldn't have to, you know them having to sell off of having to but the, the, them selling off James Harden for for financial reasons and then you get that those three guys together presumably for a long time I think that's a good thing uh, but I, I I don't know how it would end up coming together for teams like I don't know the Heat of ten years ago like if those da- if those guys can stay together and and continue to build around aging Wade and Bosch and uh, keep keep uh, prime LeBron in place without uh, you know losing him because of the, the team has no future. Then you, you get those teams for a decade. I, I don't know if that's necessarily a better thing. Uh, and I also wonder if we'd still run into problems with small market teams that say, okay, yeah, Dame Lillard uh, doesn't count against the cap for his full $40 million, but I'm still paying him literally $40 million. I don't necessarily want to go out and get another guy and also pay him $40 million because we're, we're in Portland. We're not in LA. We're not in New York, et cetera. I'm not saying that specifically about Portland. It's probably not a problem with their ownership, but it might have been a problem in OKC or other teams. And then you still get the kind of, you know, discrepancy between the big market teams, and the small target teams, the big market teams that don't mind spending over their cap versus the teams that do have to make those tough decisions still. And then you get into kind of like a more of like a baseball style power imbalance where teams are operating like the Yankees and some teams are operating like the Oakland A's. 
and that's a problem too. But I, I, I do th I, at the core of this idea, I think it's a good idea. I think it might just need some hammering out of the fine print a little bit. Yeah, I I agree with everything you said. Um, the the things that I would you know interject in, like you mentioned the heat, right? I think part of the appeal of a rule like this is not like I wasn't like a super against the heat or anything, but like that team would have never been formed, right? Because LeBron would have had his five years or six, whatever, seven years in Cleveland. And he would have, you know, hit his 50% bonus and um, would have been close to 20%. So maybe he, it's easier to build around him there. And, and well, maybe so unless LeBron just wants to go to play at South beach, which is also, sure. Possible. but even then like the, the, the heat didn't even last five years, right? Like mm -hmm. that none of them would have even gotten there at that point. And like that, it, it also like people kind of forget that like, careers don't last super long like <laughs> it's hard to be one of the best players in the league in your in your 10th or 11th year right like yeah. the only the literal only player in the league who uh this year would have qualified for this was Steph Curry he's the only mm -hmm. guy who's been on his team for 10 or more years so, like this doesn't happen often um the idea of this would be to make it happen more um and, and then you, are, would, you would probably get more teams like you know the 80 Celtics and Lakers that were it's the same kind of core three or four guys for an entire decade that's obviously a good thing for the league I would think yeah, right, right, right. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that this would, this would help. I mean, if you just look back through previous like superstars asking out, and again, I'm not like denigrating these guys, but like maybe Anthony Davis is like, hey, you know what? Like we could really get an awesome free agent here and, and that could help us contend or or Paul George or, or whoever, or, or the Thunder with like Westbrook could have had more room to sign, um, you know, better role players or, or whatever. Um, so that sort of stuff, I think, I think does like give enough of a bonus that I don't know if the numbers are exactly right. Like mm -hmm. maybe it should be different. Like maybe it should be like 70% and like 40%. I have no idea. Um, but I'm, I'm definitely open to debate on that front. Yeah. The, the flaws that I poke in my own idea here, um, there's like a couple, a couple that you didn't bring up, which is one is like, I think could lead to role players who have been on their teams for a long time asking for ridiculous salaries <laughs> because it doesn't count against the cap. Like yeah. why would Marcus smart not go to the Celtics and just say, right. Hey, pay me 25 million. It's only 12 and a half for you. Like hey, otherwise I'll go somewhere else. Right? Like, so, all right. Number 10, I don't even like need to spend mm. time on this, but like shorten the season. I, I don't think it's ever going to happen. Um, it's just my opinion uh, of all the things on here. I think this would be the most difficult to justify just in terms of money. Um, do you think that it's possible and would you be, I know you suggested your, your double header. Yeah, so you idea. already know what I think about this idea. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Uh, for those unfamiliar, my uh, extremely unpopular idea was to uh, institute a system of double headers where like 15 times a season, 10 to 15 times a season, uh, your team and another team play two games back to back and you're not allowed to play any, uh, any, any of your one players in both games at once. So you, have, you you get a couple extra guys on your roster from the G League or, or wherever else you can, you can pull them from. So you have 18 guys total. You play nine in each game. Uh, you you submit the rosters ahead of time, but not so far ahead of time that the opposing team the opposing team gets a chance to plan for it. So you end up with some pretty wonky lineups uh, and and wonky matchups in, in both games. But it's 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 kind of like harnessing the en the energy of like extra inning baseball is what I was sort of thinking, where like things are a little strange and you're you're, you're kind of you're not quite sure what you're watching, but it's kind of fun and weird and it kind of helps build character for the team and and between fans and then the organization and maybe you can sell sort of bulk tickets so that uh, you know guys get to so that the attendees get to watch both games in succession and so they're not missing out on Joel Embiid uh, for the day they're just watching one game with him and one game without him uh, and this I think it cuts down on travel. Uh, it cuts down on back to back, so you don't have to do back to backs anymore. Uh, and it cuts down on a lot of other sort of, and it, it, mostly what it cuts down on is the sort of built in rest games anyway, where you could just get DNPs because uh, you're going to play four games in five nights, or it's just uh, you, you have a back to back, or it's just uh, that, that time in the schedule. Instead of building those into the schedule, you just get these automatic 10 to 15 games off a year for your guy. And it sort of functions the same way as shortening the season without actually losing games. So uh, there's a million things wrong with that idea, of course. And you, you, you pointed out most of them yourself in that article. But I do like that more than the idea of missing games just because I love basketball. And I don't, I don't want to miss 10 games if I don't have to. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, certainly from an objective standpoint, the way the, season, the, the, way the league is going right now is untenable. Uh, my idea is probably a little too radical for, for the squares out there. Uh, so that, that's probably not going to get instituted anytime soon. If, if you have an 82 game schedule, you're going to get 15 games like this anyway, is the main point I was trying to make because it, it, we're just, we're just at that point in NBA history now where no star is going to play an entire season unless they're trying to win an MVP and then they're going to get hurt doing it probably. And uh, that's going to be its own mess of things. But 
you, you, you can't rely on these players playing every night anymore because the precedent's been set. Uh, it, it's, it's now sort of established that this is what's going to happen, that your guy's just going to miss 10 games a year, one reason or the other. So, yeah, I mean, and, and then you're going to end up with a lot of national games where you got two teams playing, but you've only heard of three guys between them. And then, and, and that's, a, that's terrible. Certainly for the casual fans, it's not great for the, for the, for the intense fans either. So certainly something needs to give here. Shorting the season is the most efficient way to do it, but it's also probably the hardest sell for the league office. And so I, I, I don't, I don't, how do, you, how do you sweeten that pot? Like how, how do you make it so the owners say, okay, we'll just take 15 fewer, you know, 15 fewer games a year. We'll lose that rake and, and just, just kind of swallow it. Is there a, like a middle ground to be reached there? I honestly don't know, man. Yeah. I don't, I, I can't, I can't come to any sort of solution that justifies the money. I, I like your double header idea. Um, but, <laughs> as you, one, but thank you. Yeah. As you can tell, as you can tell the, uh, I, I am just like extremely pro, like all wild, like sweeping sure. ideas of like changing things. I just, I just am very interested in the topic. So maybe I'm, I, my approval rating on, on these types of things is going to be very high. All right. Um, that leads us into the very last point um, I make. Which is, you know, I, it, there's very general, but just collective buy-in from the league and the media to not be so focused on the soap opera aspects. And, you know, I, I everything that I've said so far, you know, I, I, I make the point in the article that the NBA treats its viewer like not as a, as a conscientious, discerning observer who enjoys the game itself, but as like a toddler who just needs loud and shiny distractions to be entertained. And... Maybe they're not completely wrong, um, but I just think that when you do damn near nothing to promote the game itself, you get a debate culture that can only focus on other things. And that just becomes incredibly ridiculously toxic. And I am not at all trying to say that, like, we need to shove down the throat of every fan like that, you know, what every tactical thing is and what what every play is and what this term means and all that stuff. But like. When you do nothing to promote it, like I said, you you leave only other aspects of your sport to be discussed, and it ties into you know the larger thing, which is what we're talking about is t- like this is a TV product. This is a TV product, and this all of the soap opera stuff is entertaining from a Twitter perspective, from a, a, a social a just social media in general perspective. But is it getting people to tune into these games and and watch the games and care about the game itself? I don't know. Um, I'm I just. I make the point in the article that, you know, I think that the NFL does by a factor of a thousand, a better job of like teaching fans about the game. Mm -hmm. And I think that on average, a way higher percentage of NFL fans could tell you what cover three means or what a post route is than the percent of NBA fans who could tell you what a drop coverage is. And a drop coverage happens on every play. (laughs) And it's like, I I don't think any, like, like so few NBA fans even know that. And you know, I, there's so many examples you could point to of like where this comes from. I think one example is just watch, just watch like the NFL Network and watch the stuff they talk about. And it's it's like it, it's the actual game. That's mm-hmm. what they talk about. And as far as like the NBA, there's this like conscious objective on the behalf of the media to paint the NBA as this like quirky live storybook soap opera, like drama, 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 drama. And it's like we're we're promoting a sport, you know that, right? Like that's, that's part of it. Like you, you there has to be some level of, of interest in that. And it has to tie back to that. Um, I, I, people probably view this as some like unchangeable, like product of, you know, this generation, but I don't like football is the example of this where it's like, I think that people just parrot what they see on TV or on social media and football talking heads condition the fan to, be attuned to the fact that it's a deeply tactical game, which is why if you even just like run into an NFL fan on the street, if you're just like talk to someone about the Eagles, what are you going to talk about? You're going to talk about like, oh, the pass rush. And do you think that the Eagles corners can hold up in, in coverage and so on and so forth? And it's like, if you were to just bump into someone, if you bump into like some NBA Twitter person on the street, you're going to be like, did you see what so-and-so commented on so-and-so's Instagram? And like, mm. it's just, it's, it's broken, man. It's broken. And I, I, I enjoy that stuff as much as the next guy. But like I said, I think that the NBA is when you only focus on that aspect of things and you only promote that aspect of things, um, it just it ruins the debate culture around the sport. Yeah, I mean, this is all fair. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of a two minds with this because I do believe that 
the sort of, I mean, I don't, I don't so well, let me just clarify. When you're talking about soap operatics, you're talking about like narrative based stuff. You're talking about like trade rumors. You're talking about like, oh, can LeBron win it, you know, at, at age 37? Or are you talking about, uh, well, where's LeBron going after this? Like, like what, what, what yeah, kind of stuff are you Kind of okay. all of it. Like anything okay. that doesn't have to do with the actual game itself. Like, okay. like will it's like we can't even we can't even get to like game three of any playoff series before it's like will mm -hmm. star x demand a trade if he you know what i mean like yeah yeah sure uh and and that that I, I i do hear that and i agree with it to a certain extent but i'm also torn because i think a lot of the stuff is what makes the nba great and what makes it popular as well like beyond uh you know something like baseball I'm, I'm not saying anything that has been said a million times already but obviously the the, the sort of personal relationship that everyone has to not just what with players that are on their own teams but with players around the entire league where you don't really get that i mean maybe you get a little bit in football but not quite the same way and def definitely don't get it at all in baseball where you, you don't necessarily care about like what jose altuve you know, you know at least pre-cheating you don't care about what this means for his legacy the same way you do you care what something means for paul george's legacy it's just not the same thing uh but in, in terms of the actual game to game you know management and the game to game coverage you're right that it's swung too far in that direction and that, uh, you know, the, the pr promoting of the, the biggest names and the promoting of the biggest storylines does sort of take away from the actual game action. Uh, and, you know, the, this finals, I guess, was sort of a crystallization of that where you get two teams where the narratives are not, not, I mean, they, they're, it's not like there's no narratives, you know, obviously Giannis sticking around and making something for himself. Milwaukee's a big deal. Obviously Chris Paul making his first finals is a big deal, but it's not the same sort of sweeping kind of, it's not the stuff that you can drop in a casual fan. And they'll instantly understand immediately what the game means to both teams. And, but, but from a, a you know, a play standpoint, it was certainly one of the, the better and more appreciated finals that we've had in recent years. So uh, certainly one that didn't make this final matchup feel like a flop would be a good thing. You, if, if you can kind of build it so that, kind of a, a tactical finals and a finals where the game action is, is more exciting than the storylines going on behind it. Uh, and so that, that you can kind of keep the focus on the game itself. That would be a good thing. Uh, but I'm also very aware of the fact that, you know, stories about uh, trade rumors do better than, than game recaps of, of, of closeout finals games. Like, like that's what, that's what drives interest in the league is interest in these players as figures and um, what, what they mean beyond the, the game action itself, what they mean off the court and all that that's sort of what makes the NBA special. And that's also the NBA's kind of greatest calling card on in, in a larger sense. So I don't think you can really take that much away from it, but obviously there's a balance to be reached for sure. And they're not really doing that right now. And that probably is doing a disservice to the game. Yeah. I mean, I, I totally agree with everything you just said. Um, I think that the analogy I would make is that they, there has to be like a balance between like giving the fans in terms of content, there has to be a balance of like the sugary stuff in your mm -hmm. diet versus like the protein. You know what I mean? Like the NFL, if you just even go to like the NFL's YouTube page, you'll see all kinds of like deeply tactical stuff. Like it'll be like videos of Amari Cooper breaking down his footwork on his routes. Mm. And it's like stuff like, like the, the NFL, make no mistake, is making a conscious effort to promote that stuff. And when you do that, I think you can sustain a lot better. And, you know, you're absolutely right that in the short term, every single story about trade rumors about you know players beefing or whatever like that stuff is always going to do better but i think my point is that if you don't include some of the stuff with like actual substance you're going to get like a you're going to get very like shallow interest in the sport um like pervasive shallow interest which i think is is what happens um but yeah i mean I also make the point that I think if we did steps one through 10, step 11 would, would happen automatically. <laughs> Maybe. You know, like, yeah. All right, man, that is, that is all I have. Um, but thank you. Thank you so much for being the, the outlet here. I, uh, <laughs> I, I appreciate, you know, I, I, these are all just my like insane ideas. I, I just, I really enjoy talking about this stuff for sure. Very interesting subject to me. So, uh, so thank you for that. I'm curious if you have one uh, pick one thing I brought up that is either your favorite or that you completely hate or what's, what's going to stick out in your head from this. All right. Uh, starting the games on time. Certainly. Uh, <laughs> is, 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 I mean, that, that one's just like, like yeah, like, like why not? Let's just, let's just do that. Uh, and uh, definitely like the, the, the Jersey balance between the rosters, like, like that, that's, that's one of those things that when you're watching it, you're just like, this is so dumb. Like, like, mm -hmm. the, the, like how, how, like doesn't, like you just look at it. Like just look at it and see that something's not right here. Like let's fix that one for sure. Yeah, I don't know if that I don't, I don't know I don't know if that necessarily fixes you know rating problems and stuff. But um, <laughs> it's a good first step, and uh, hopefully that can lead to some of the other uh, sort of bigger picture fixes that we need to institute here. Yeah. 
All right, man. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. And for everybody listening, as always, this video was sponsored by Body Bio. My name's Eddie. I'm a bodyweight boot camp instructor. I was teaching a class outdoors. Class ended, I got in my car. My body started shutting down. My legs were going numb. My vision started going white. I downed Body Bio Elite and just passed out. A lot of people that have heat strokes this severe don't wake up on their own. These days, I make sure to add Body Bio Elite to my water whenever I do workouts. I'm where I am today because of Body Bio Elite.